Okay, and the blessing over the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher bakar banu mikol hamin Venatan lanu et terato Baruch atah Adonai Noten ha Torah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. You know, I really love that blessing because uh, especially, especially when it says um, uh, uh, he chose us from all the peoples. You know, we have been chosen, you know, uh, to follow him and it's our choice, yes, you know, but we've been chosen, you know, and praise. Thank you, Father. Okay, I'm going to read, I'm going to begin reading in 35.1, Exodus 35.1. So if you would follow along, and I'm going to be skipping around. So Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it must be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Then if we go to uh, uh, chapter 36, and it says, then Moses summoned Bezalel and Holalabi and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring freewill offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work and, and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. If you turn to page 37 or chapter 37, <laughs> for me, it's page 37. <laughs> Bezalel made the Ark of Acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and made a gold molding around it. He cast four gold rings for it and fastened them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold, and he inserted the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. Let's just go all the way to 38 now. And I would just like to read this in 38. And this is in 38, verse 8. They made the, bra the bronze basin and its bronze stand from the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. We're going to dive into this parashah now, but let's do the blessing as... Uh, after the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher atan lanu Torah dimet, vechaye olam, natavotekanu, Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha Torah, amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. You may sit down. At home, you may sit down too. 
<laughs> okay, everyone. You know, before I get started, I was just, uh, I don't know about any of you, but if you get up in the morning, you watch the news to see what's going on, especially uh, with, still here. yeah, we're still here uh, with Russia, you know, invading uh, Ukraine. But uh, it was interesting. I heard something this morning uh, that I didn't know that, uh, you know, um, the four years that we had with Trump in office, uh, you know how the Ukrainians, well, the Russia was supposed to be able to take uh, the, the, the capital in two hours. Well, they still haven't taken it because the people are fighting back yeah, yeah. but what but what i did find out was all the weapons did you know that all the weapons that they have they were given to though well, they were sold to ukraine during the trump administration you know so these are the weapons that they they put in the hands of their people and and uh praise god i mean uh um you know what's his name putin or you know he's uh it's like, it's not that he's not running scared, but it's more like he's embarrassed now. He's, uh, you know, there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he thought it was just gonna be a little uh, two day affair and we've got Ukraine and well, it's not working out that way. So, and then on to the next country, you're right. So, but uh, I just want I just didn't know that. I didn't realize that uh, the foresight of, uh, you know, they're saying, and the reason a lot of this went down uh, during his administration he did not trust russia and you know not like our administration today okay let's get into uh Vallejo, uh torah study and in the first roman num roman numeral number one by and he assembled and he assembled if you're here uh in person, I, I had two uh, notes back there. And uh, so you, later on, you'll need the, the smaller one. But by a hell means, and he assembled. In the complete Jewish Bible, it begins, uh, the, the parasha begins like this. Moshe assembled the whole community of people. Moshe, by hell, benai Israel. We then dive into a parasha where it seems we've read this before. 95% of this parasha is about the Mishkan, about the tabernacle. Okay, again, just like we read in the previous portions of uh, Teruma and uh, Tetzaveh, again, we are discussing the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Chapter 35 has 35 verses in it, and 32 of the verses pertain to the tabernacle. So this must mean that the tabernacle is the most important topic in all of this parish all, correct? No. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> uh, wrong. We'll, we'll see shortly what is the most what is most important to the Lord. You know, the Midrash says that Moses assembled the nation of Israel to inform them that God would be very happy uh, with the work that they are about to do. Because in the previous chapters, if, if you recall, they were, they were uh, given instructions. And uh, now in this parasha, they're going to start putting everything to work. They're going to get started and get her done. So, uh, so but, but what we find here, that there's one thing that's more important than the tabernacle, and that's the Sabbath. Work may be performed during the six days, but however, on the seventh day, you must refrain from all labor. In verse three, God also tells Moses to say to the children of Israel, uh, you are not to kindle a fire of, in any of your homes on Shabbat. You know what? Uh, it just hit me right now, and we're going to stop just for a second. Uh, there's a bill in the Senate that's going to be uh, voted on. I think it's tomorrow. Yeah. S 1975. S 1975. And this bill, if the Senate passes it, it's going to be one step closer uh, for uh, 
to abolish what Texas has put in place. In other words, if this bill goes through, abortions could be on demand all the way up to uh, childbirth. So uh, we just need to pray against this, S 1975. Father, we lift up uh, this bill to you, Father, that you would destroy it, abolish it, Father, send it right back to the pit of hell where it came out of, Father. Father, that you would instruct all those that are voting that they would vote, Father, for what is righteous, not for what is wrong. Father, this is an evil bill. Father, send it back, Lord, to, to the depth of, of Hades or hell, where it came from, Lord, because this is not your word. This is not a part of you, Lord. So, Father, take control of the situation and just... Uh, have these people that are going to vote, vote a godly way, Father. I know that's impossible for some, Father, but Father, Father, just, just, just stir the heart of, of the few that need to, to uh, move this and abolish it, Father. So, Lord, we put this into your hands in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, it's very important. We need to, you know, look at the news and see how they've done. And I mean, it, it's ridiculous some of the things that they come up with. But you know, when you don't have the Lord in your life, you're gonna, you're gonna come up with, with, with any type of evil. And, and they have. <clears throat> okay, let's get back to uh, the parasha. The first three verses in this Torah portion carry more weight than the rest of the chapter, as well as the previous two parashahs. As important as the tabernacle is, no work may be done on the Sabbath. And it's Rashi who says that the day that testifies to the existence of God supersedes the tabernacle where God is served. The acknowledgement of God must precede service. Uh, so let's look at the words at that. Oh, go ahead. I just see an echo, but I don't. Oh, is that you? Were you going to, you want to say something, Kent? Okay, go ahead and let me, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Um, uh, this has to do with the Torah reading that you had a few minutes ago. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually for Pastor Bruce. Um, okay. It said clearly in no uncertain terms, not to light a fire on Shabbat. So why do you um, question that or refute it? Because you always say it's okay to drive on Shabbat and et cetera. Well, you know, uh, I do have uh, the 39 prohibitions on Shabbat. Pastor Bruce will answer right now. But I do have the 39 prohibitions. And when you read about lighting a fire, you could see how the rabbis have stretched this and applied oh, okay. to every other circumstance, like like turning on a light switch. And and I was going to get to that later, but I'll let Pastor Bruce uh, answer this. I think it's important. I I, I go to the scripture all the time uh, in Acts, where David is on his deathbed. And it says that he fulfilled the will of God. He fulfilled the Torah in his generation. Listen, things change. And what, what was, again, we have to go back to the essence. What Amen. is lighting a fire? Amen. Um, they didn't have to deal with light switches in Moshe's day. So... Yeah, and it, I argue that building a fire was real work. And if you've ever been out in the wilderness, it is work. Um, but beyond that, I think that we have to get the mind of God for our generation. Because if you're trying to take the same thoughts and regulations that they, they used 3,500 years ago, you're going to find yourself in really uh, yeah. uh, a very legalistic uh, venture. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you can't do anything. Uh, you know, the cities were laid out 
uh, by a Sabbath measure in those days. So you could walk over to the, the local store or whatever, uh, synagogue, uh, you could walk to your neighbor's house. These days, you can't walk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's no facilities near you. There's no, you know, so I think we just have to take that and, and try to figure it out. And the Jewish people today are really leaning on traditions from thousands of years ago, rather than trying to seek God for this generation. Right. So I, that, that would be my response. I'm going to, I'm going to go to you right now, Sharon, but, uh, uh, hold on. Oh, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we're not negating what's written in the word of God, but we're, we're praying for discernment and wisdom. What does it mean for us right. today? Mean, yeah. Right. We're not saying, well, no, today. it doesn't mean for us. It's still written. What does yeah. it mean for us today? Well, you know, uh, three, 3,500 years ago, uh, people, uh, if they went to war, they attacked each other with swords. Uh, how would it be if uh, Ukraine went after Russia with swords? Well, it wouldn't go too well. So uh, I, I, I agree with what Pastor Bruce said. Uh, Sharon, do you have anything to add? Go ahead and unmute, unmute yourself. Um, a couple things. Um, first, we've been taught that the Peshat meaning never goes away. And I don't think it's difficult to keep the Peshat meaning. Um, as far as fire goes, I, I don't think I would extend it beyond the words of Torah. Right. To cars and, and other things. Um, Cause that's like putting fences around what the Torah says. But I think the deeper meaning, you shall not ignite a fire. Fire is consuming. It consumes everything that it's, that's fed to it. Um, and I think maybe the deeper meaning is we're not to start arguments. We're not to start um, something that would divide the congregation. Quarreling. You know, leading on that the fire is all consuming. And, and I think the deeper meaning applies to us. Um, but I think it's, it's easy enough to keep the Peshat meaning. I don't know. You're right. You're right. I lit a fire last night. It was after <laughs> in the evening to keep my yeah. great grandson warm. So yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce, and then I'll go to Pastor Paul. Yeah, but if we lit a, you know, if we lost power during the day, you would have lit a fire during the day. Yeah. Because it's cold. But the many of the rabbis say this lighting of the fire has to do with quarreling within the, the marriage they context. They, they do. And uh, you are not to argue on the Shabbat. You are not to fight on the Shabbat uh, amongst husband and wife, particularly, because it breaks the unity of the oneness. Yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Paul. Um, whenever you're dealing with a fire, basically what you're taking is matter and you're turning it into energy which means that all work that is normally done during the six days is doing exactly that. You're putting matter into a situation where you're developing something. So God didn't want that to be happening. But the real point here is we're to have a complete dependence on the Lord during this day. Right. Which means that if you really have dependence on him, just like gathering in the manna, which got provided enough for it to be done on the day before the Shabbat. If you're really sincere and you really want to just simply trust in God, you don't have to light a fire on Shabbat. You can start the fire before and just leave it on. You can also make a meal before and eat the meal. Now, I understand. But now that's not trusting in God, is it? Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Did they trust God to get the manna the day before? No, what's happening now is you're preparing in the flesh the day before. So now you're just that, negated that, all. That is saying that God prepared in the flesh the day before by no. providing manna. No. Twice as much no. to gather up. I'm talking yes. about cooking. <laughs> huh? I'm talking about cooking. 
So they prepare the day before. So so where is the trust in God you're talking about? Does the food disappear? No, that's not what we're talking Does about. Does it turn We're rotten? talking about man's efforts. Yeah. You know, that's I've what had, we're talking men, about. Men always have to participate yeah. in what God does. Yeah. Well, then, that, not, what I'm saying yeah. it's not a, it's not an issue of not trusting God. Yeah. 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 You know, let me well, we're not let me about not trusting okay, God. Okay, that's about, just what you mentioned. Well, yeah. when we when yeah. we prepare for something, are we <laughs> trusting God or not? But but the way the context you put it in was if you do this you're not trusting God and that's not correct. Well, that's not what I'm saying. That's what that's how it came out. I think that's probably you might perceive it. Well, but, I, <laughs> but the, the basic line here is simple. There is a transference of energy that God is simply saying trust Him. I you know but let me interject here. I'll tell you something. And wait, hold on. In the Jewish community. What they do is they have what they call Shabbat lights. And the Shabbat lights, they flick on 20 minutes before uh, the Shabbat arrives. So they do everything they can. And, and as you know, we said, is, is that trusting God? You know, you're, and when we were in uh, Jerusalem, uh, they have Shabbat elevators. And when you get inside the elevator, it's going to automatically go up to the next floor, the next floor, one floor at a time. So you don't have to touch anything. But the thing is, is and their whole idea is let the Gentile or the Goyim do everything for you. And that way you can be observant to the Shabbat. But see, they don't want that to push is, the button. They don't want to put, yeah. But you can take the food you prepared the day before and put it in the bowl work that would be this work. is absolute ludicrousness. okay yeah go ahead uh gary yeah yeah i could hear you god gave us the torah as guidelines yeshua comes along and he clarifies the meat the, the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter of the law. And I think what we're doing now is swallowing camels and choking on gnats. I really wish Colette was here to, <laughs> really to, to give us her wisdom. wisdom. Yeah. yeah. And I think I'll, I'll say it. I was dreading today. That this is the last time I plug in on Colette. Right. And I miss them. Yeah. yeah. And I think today is the day that their loss is impacting me the most because we would see them. I keep looking over there at Pastor Paul and I see that on Colette. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that perhaps we should. Choke on camels and swallow gnats instead of the <laughs> No, I think this is very good because I know what you're saying. When Yeshua, Yeshua, you know, I mean, we know David would walk through the fields and he fed his, uh, the men that were with him, you know, on the Sabbath. So they're, they're, they're doing work, which is okay. And then who went into the, the and pulled the, the showbread out and, and, and ate it, uh, David, David, David did that. So uh, with all this, uh, there's a deeper meaning. There is a deeper meaning. So, yeah. Uh, Maria, were you going to say something? Yes. As I know there's some people. Why am I so loud? You're always loud. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got Ray here. Ray will take care of it. I have been like some members in our congregation that were ex Seventh Day Adventists. I've been keeping the Sabbath for over 45 years. And I can tell you honestly, I still don't understand it yeah. because I am taught one way 
and then somebody else would come and say, no, this is the way. And then I'll read it and I said, well, it doesn't sound it, it must be this way. And now it's become spiritual, which makes me feel like now I'll never get the hang of it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I read this, it, what I came up with was, you're not supposed to do anything that creates. Right. Because God stopped creating it. And on the seventh day, he rested from creation. Now they don't burn the wood. It's not that they go out to get it because it's already there, but you're creating energy. You are creating fire. You are creating ashes. That's what, you know, we sit here and we chuckle. Oh, they get the Gentiles to do it, you know? Yeah. At least they get somebody to do it. We just do it ourselves. We break the commandments. Yeah. We should look upon ourselves first. I still don't know. Well, you know, with yeah. all the talk here, how to keep the Sabbath. It's, this is difficult. This, this is a difficult, uh, you know, and uh, I know the, the Jews would say that it's not difficult, just, you know, don't do anything, but then they'll, it's and, difficult but, for us but because we're who so is guilty? The person that, that uh, go, go ahead and does that on the Sabbath or the one who picks somebody else to do it for them? Yeah, the one that makes them. That They're both. Them, yeah. I think they both are. So, well, here, let me move on, you guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know it. I know. It. We don't have Yeshiva today, so I guess we can, we can go on, right? <laughs> okay. No, but yeah, we're, I've, got, I've got a lot of uh, stuff here on the Sabbath, so I'll probably hit it again, and I may hit it for you, Maria. Uh, it says, and Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. And then Moses goes on to say, for six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. You may, you may have missed this here in verse one, but, it's, but when it says, Vayachel, assemble. Turn to Hebrews 10, 25. And I'm going to read uh, uh, Hebrews 10, 25 uh, from the Amplified Bible. <clears throat> and it says, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Messiah's return approaching. The Israelites or Jews uh, were gathering on the Sabbath for thousands of years. You may be thinking just because the word by hell is being used here, we are commanded to gather on the Shabbat. Yes, we are. God could have said, why didn't he use the, the, the term or the verse, uh, speak to the children of Israel? He didn't say, speak to the children of Israel. He said, Vayichel, assemble, okay? <clears throat> and he said, and then going right to his most holy, holiest day, I would say, yes, we are to gather on the Shabbat. Not Zoom in, not YouTube live, but you are to, you are, if you are able to get out of bed, then turn off the TV and go to church on the Sabbath. Okay. Only one other time, Vayachel appears in the Torah. And that's in the story of Korak. Okay. Korak assembled the people. He assembled the people. But this was to go against Moses and Aaron. Moses assembled the people to observe the Shabbat. <clears throat> So in Roman numeral A, the whole congregation gathered together. The fill-in is congregation. And when, the, when you gather for the Shabbat, uh, all the people, and, and number one there below that, Torah is given to everyone. 
if everybody is assembled on the Shabbat, everybody comes to uh, to the congregate or the the synagogue or the church on the Shabbat, Torah is given to everyone. And I think what it's saying right here in letter B, going to church with Moses. So, uh, okay, go ahead, Pastor Paul. You had something to say. Oh, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Pastor Paul. <laughs> In our generation. Yes. Because that becomes an interesting concept. In our generation, the assembly, does it have to be a literal assembly or can it be a virtual assembly? Because the reality of our life today is most things are now virtual as opposed to literal. And I'm only saying that because in our generation, the, if, we, if we stick with the absolute literal, then, you know, I argue both sides because I, I like to see where we're going with stuff. About lighting a fire, do you really think that it matters that much to me about lighting a fire? It does in the concept of trying to figure out what God's trying, God's to, say. trying to say. Yeah. But the literal aspect of lighting the fire, if my grandchild is cold, am I going to light a fire? No. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt about it. Um, and so in the same way we're talking about here, I know every pastor wants to build a sanctuary with every seat filled and all of that. And then that's, we should, if you can, and you can get here, but let's, let's look at where we're at right now. We're in the mountains, gas is approaching five bucks a gallon going to seven. <laughs> Is that going to facilitate some of our people that are way out there coming, you know, on Shabbat? Oh, it's going to affect it, yeah. You know, it, it complicates things. That's all I'm saying. No, you're absolutely right. And that's why I said, you know, if you're able, if you're able to get up and get out and you have that choice, are I mean, are you staying home because it's convenient, you know? And you can get up and, and go fellowship because I, I know that uh, I'd rather see all of my my family here in person. You know, I mean, it's great that you we have Zoom and YouTube live, but uh, the whole idea we had a, a wonderful uh, Shabbat service on Friday night here. We had a lot of people here. Same thing off the mountain. You know, it's wonderful. So, uh, but I know what you're saying, especially when the time comes in Ukraine, are they going to be able to gather together? No, pro pro probably not, you know, so that somebody may have to Zoom from home. Go ahead, Tila. Well, I, I agree with all that, but, you know, I think about the Holocaust at the time. Yeah. They would, they still, even though there was just a few and they were in their different um, places, okay, yeah they still gathered together to acknowledge yeah. God. And I think that's the most important thing is, yeah. what are we doing? Are we acknowledging God? Yeah, I understand the Zoom. I understand the gas and all that. But where's your heart in really, yeah. truly wanting to acknowledge God? Right. And your, your brethren, you know, what are we doing? You know, right. that's all I want to say. Yeah. Okay, uh, what I wanted to get to, too, is, so we'll do this right now. I'm not going to go through all the 39 categories, but I do want to say this. The rabbis looked at the building of the tabernacle as the direct reason of what is prohibited on the Sabbath. Uh, and it's because of this parashah. Yes, Peggy? Okay, Sharon, unmute yourself. Just a couple of points. Um, this law was given in the wilderness where the whole community of Israel could come together and be assembled, correct? It was, yeah. Community. That's not true in this day, but if God is in the business of restoring everything, which I think he is, um, and I know many uh, communities are interested in coming together um, where it would be very easy to walk to an assembly point. 
Right. Um, so in some ways we are uh, at this point in history going against Torah, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. But I think God is in the works of of restoring what was. Yeah. His 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 assembly, his ecclesia. Um, so, sorry, I did. You know, I'm struggling with. I've always struggled with having to drive. You know, how many miles yeah. and all that um, on the Shabbat. But um, but it, to me, we're doing the best we can at this point in history. That's what the Didache says. Says it yeah. says if you can't keep all of Torah, do the best you can, you know, and, and I think that's the one thing you said right now that everybody needs to hear is uh, you, you do the best you can. So, okay, um, but let's look at, at verse three, you shall not kindle a fire. I like how the Humash explained this. It says, since kindling a fire pertains to cooking and baking, Food prep preparation is forbidden on the, on the Sabbath. Then it goes on to say there is no prohibition against enjoying its light or heat. Well, the sages misinterpret this passage to say that all use of fire is forbidden. So they would sit in darkness throughout the Sabbath just as they, just as they have sat in spiritual darkness all their lives. This, and this, is, this was taken from the Humash. As Pastor Bruce uh, has said before, and, uh, and, and a lot of us have said it too, uh, uh, it's not about turning on and off a light switch. There's more to it. How could you not kindle, how could you shall not kindle a fire get all the way to turning on a light switch? So, uh, it's, you know, and it's on, it's on that, uh, I think it's number two on your list that I gave you, okay? You shall not carry on the Sabbath is another law for complete Sabbath rest. And this is one of the few categories of work that is actually mentioned uh, in the Torah. Uh, it's also the very first type of work that was prohibited. This commandment of, of the Sabbath was given in connection with the manna. But what possible type of work was involved in gathering a portion of manna for one's family? The rabbis uh, state, obviously, this is caring. You go out and you pick up the manna. So, so they could have a complete rest on the Shabbat. There was no manna there. Now they don't have to go out and carry. Thus, when Moses told the people in Exodus 16, 20, 29, let no man leave his place on the seventh day. He was telling them that they could not carry the manna. Okay, um, I know this is a hard subject. <laughs> uh, the Torah also gives an account of a man who was put to death for gathering wood on the Sabbath. Here again, according to some commentators, uh, his violation of the Sabbath involved caring. And, and, uh, and as I said earlier, all 39 prohibitions are taken from, if remember, right after this, we go into the building of the tabernacle. So if this is more important, if the Sabbath is more important than the tabernacle, what kind of work are they doing on the tabernacle that is prohibited. And that's what they're saying. Every type of work that they're doing, you are not to do on the Sabbath. Uh, who was first, Peggy, you or? Okay. Just switch it all the way up. You don't need a light, just there. Okay. Um, you guys help me here because this is what I'm reading. Um, you shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Does not kindle mean to get something started? Which is telling me, if you already have a fire, you're good. Don't start a new one. Which also leads me to the time when the guy was out there gathering wood. 
what was his purpose to start a fire? For me, he's saying, don't start one on the Sabbath day. If you've got one going, you're good, but don't start a new one. Yeah. 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 Yes? Yes. Okay. The, well, that's where I'm getting at. In, in both cases, I think Pastor Bruce and Pastor Paul are correct. You know what? That is very good logic. Now you know what. Now you know why I married that woman. <laughs> Go ahead, Bonnie. I'm just wondering about the Sabbath rest. Does does this include their animals? Because they have to feed their animals every day, and isn't that considered work? That's that's work, but they probably put out an extra portion the day before, a double portion. So they Save, almost know that yeah. that extra portion on the yeah. Sabbath. But like Pastor Paul just stated too, saving a life is a higher uh, call, higher priority. That takes precedent over. It's just like we tell people, uh, it's just like at Yom Kippur. Um, how many of you refrain from drinking and everything, food, everything on Yom, Yom Kippur? You know, I, I do. Okay. But then you're alone. I'm alone. Yeah. 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 No, you're absolutely right. I do. I'm capable of doing it. Okay. So, I, you know, I do that. But I'll tell you one thing if somebody, and I've had this before many times, people have said that I need to take my medication. And when I take my medication, I need to have something in my, my stomach and this. And I said, then do you do it? You know, your health is more important. It takes priority. So, uh, so you do that. And then after you take your pills or you eat something and then take your pills, well, then you don't do, you know, you refrain. You do the best you can, you know. Go ahead, Pastor Paul, use the microphone. Uh, going back to Hebrews 10, uh -huh. uh, the verse that follows right after 25, it says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, all right, now that to me settles everything. You receive the knowledge of the truth. The question is, what is truth? Yeah. Once you find what truth is, then there's no question as what to do. Yeah. And so I leave it at that because truth is subjective to so many things. Yes, it is. It's like, okay, this is truth, but <laughs> that, that truth only works in this circumstance change the circumstance and truth then becomes subjective to the higher responsibility or circumstance that it's involved in. So, you know, as we go through all of this stuff and, you know, we discuss it, we bat it back and forth because right. it's good to do that because then people have to think. But when you come down to the bottom line of what's going on, we have to realize, is that the ultimate truth? And if it's the ultimate truth, then that's it. Yeah. But if it's not the ultimate truth, then it is subjective. Yeah. You know, and, and like I was stating before, too, it's like, uh, you know, the, the rabbis, you know, are all over the place. I mean, what do they say? Uh, two rabbis, uh, three opinions. I mean, yeah, at least. Yeah. It, it's just like caring. It says you shall not carry because that was part of the work that they did on the tabernacle. But they say. Say carrying in a private home is permitted on the Sabbath. It's only in a public domain that it is forbidden. So, so, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's what got Yeshua in trouble. Yeah. You know. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go to Tila first, Kent. Well, it's kind of like there's a there's a stop sign out there in Apple Valley. It's out in the desert, and every time I come to the stop sign, I stop. Why do I stop? Because the sign says to stop, and I know that that would be the right thing to do. Even though there's nobody around, I could run that stop sign every time. But because I know what the truth is, I do it, and I stop every single time. And I've seen people just run through that thing, you know, you know I'm, I'm maybe, you know, a quarter of a mile, and they just run through it. I don't, because I know what it is, and I'm that authority is not only spiritual authority, but it is character authority. You know what, Keila, I love you. You're a better person than me. 
Hey, I would look both ways. Hey, no, no, nobody within four miles. Oh. <laughs> How many of you, if you had a straightaway, you had a stop sign there, but no cars in e anywhere? How, well, how many would drive right through it? <laughs> men, all the men. <laughs> well, you see, you're better than me. I don't know if I would slow down. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay, Kent, unmute yourself and share. Oh, okay. There, uh, good news, if you go to Jerusalem, you can carry. There is a string around Jerusalem, so you can take your keys with you if you go to synagogue on Shabbat. So that oh. is, is in Jerusalem. The second thing I wanted to say, in case nobody knows, uh, Orthodox Jews say that Gentiles are exempt from doing, from eating kosher or abiding by that. It's not like they're saying, oh, let a Gentile do it in a derogatory fashion. They are simply exempt. They still go to heaven, a different heaven according to their belief, but I just wanted to make those two points, that's all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, let Caleb, let, let the dogs do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh yeah, they had a lot of Gentiles. It was a mixed multitude in the wilderness and then people are thinking, well, the mixed multitude uh, died off. No, it didn't. When Joshua crossed the Jordan River and entered the, entered the promised land, he entered with a mixed multitude. So, uh, so be it. I don't know. Yes. Did, is there anything on that list of 39 that somebody wanted to, uh, to bring up? But uh, go ahead. Bonnie, go ahead. Wasn't the mixed multitude included in the Jewish community when God established them. So why are they still called the mixed multitude? Um, you know, that's a good question because you'd figure when you're grafted in, you are, you are adopted. I, I don't know how many uh, people here that have been adopted uh, that uh, you're adopted and they still uh, look at you as, oh, you're the adopted son or you're the adopted daughter. You know, uh, you don't say stuff like that. You know, I mean, we we did. Yeah, we you're, you're part of the family. You are the family. You know, there's an inheritance for you just as it is for 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 all the other children. So your, father told me I was adopted. your grandfather told you he's the one he's the one who broke the news to you. <laughs> yeah, I kept throwing, I kept throwing stones at his bobber at the farm. Oh. And he turned to me and said, you're adopted, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. The, the problem with the Jews is it becomes a, uh, either a biological question or a spiritual question. So spiritually, we're we're spiritual Israel. Paul makes that very clear in Galatians six, um, and so we're grafted in in that way. But biologically, even if you're adopted in the natural, you're not biologically connected to that family. Uh, even if you convert, you're still. Even if you convert, you're not biologically a Jew. So, and the problem with the Jews is God has really confounded the whole problem because nobody can define who a Jew really is. No one's ever been able to do it because they come from every ethnicity, every culture, every nation, every faith. Right. Uh, and so nobody really even knows who a Jew is, yeah. which becomes a really, that's why Hitler had to, he had to come up with uh, a definition and he chose to go on a biological line. And, and even back in these days, you have to remember, kings would always emerge out of a biological line. And, and so, 
And we have that same problem even in the genealogies, because even in the biblical genealogies, the woman is never mentioned. However, all the biological stuff comes from the woman, or the vast majority of it, and the spiritual comes from the man. So we have this dilemma that has just always gone on, and no one can really define it very clearly. Yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Paul, and then I'll go to Sharon. <laughs> okay. Um, in my family, the tree didn't fork, so I was related, but uh, that's a different story. <laughs> but I bring that up for this reason, because we, we think biologically, yeah. but reality is God is spirit, and he said, let us make man in our image. Well, what image is he making man to be? Because when you remember the Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, that when a man dies, the body returns to the dust of the earth from which it came, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. So in the spiritual realm, we are one echad. Yes. Because you are a spiritual being. You happen to be in a physical body. The physical body, this is where all the craziness about race comes in. Race means that thing. It, you are a human being that is a spiritual entity in a physical body, no matter what it looks like. You're tall, you're black, you're white, you're fat, you're skinny. It makes no difference. But we are one. We identify, quote unquote, biologically in order to separate us. Right, right. Go ahead, Sharon. Unmute yourself. You know I'm sorry, I got caught up in everybody else's thoughts and um, I forgot what I was going to say. So we'll, we'll leave it for later. Hey, I'm glad I never do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> you, oh, yeah. You know, but I was just going to, maybe this might bring it back because I was going to get to a couple of things. It's just like uh, we have a, a, a woman in our congregation that uh, when we started talking about this, uh, I think a few years ago, we talked about planting and gardening and everything. And she said, well, for me, I enjoy doing that. That's not work. I just get out there and I have a joyful time, you know, singing and, uh, and, and doing things like that. That's but the worst kind of work. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that's, that's one of the prohibitions here. Or how about some of you that might want to, on Shabbat, Oh, I'm just going to sit back on the couch and relax, and you're going to need a needlepoint. Well, sewing is, that's one of the prohibitions. You cannot do that on the Shabbat. So there's, your, yeah, so you, there's things there that, uh, if, but what the Jews say is that this is taken, oh, okay, I'll get to that. We give note every Shabbat. Oh, that's right. Writing. Writing. Oh, yeah. Yep. Writing and erasing. I just, there it is. Number six or number uh, 21, erasing. Right before that, right. Oh, go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, she remembered. Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, I just remembered. I want to know exactly who came up with these 39 um, areas of prohibition was that god was it oral law or was it the sages the sages uh sharon the rabbi okay. you're right They're, okay many years later they decided that well here we're going to come up with uh what you cannot do on the sabbath and they're the ones that came up with the 39 so but, i don't think we're held to that do you what's that I don't think we're held to their uh, interpretation. Do you? But I but I brought this forward because if you look it up, uh, there's good. You'll find uh, some of the rabbis from like the 15th century. They're the ones that came up with the 39. So it took that long for them to put something like this in place. So go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Yeah, if you'll remember, too, when I was teaching on Shabbat, I was teaching that the rabbis also teach. These 39 are broken down into four categories. Yes. And Yeshua, in his ministry, in his life, he broke all four uh, categories. 
which is is a statement for sure yeah. of some sort even though they weren't even categorized at this point in time he broke all four categories for the higher essence the higher yeah. calling of the shabbat amen yeah and that's why he was very 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 disliked from the, the, that's why they killed him. That's why the Pharisees, major, not all, uh, because I don't ever want to put all in there because there are many of the Pharisees that they came to the acknowledgement that Yeshua is the Messiah. So, but uh, the majority of them, they, he was, he was just uh, stirring the waters, uh, you know, causing conflict and, uh, and they didn't like that. He was speaking the truth. So there, like I said, the 39, I think it's very important to note that uh, this, this isn't something that is uh, biblical in uh, that we, sh we should hold on to, but uh, this is how, how the, the Jewish community looks at Shabbat. And it's not even all of them either. It would be maybe your uh, Orthodox and, uh, you know, your conservatives and, you know, but you know, you have reformed Jews that are, you know, I remember uh, I used to, <laughs> I used to, I used to work at Dodger Stadium selling uh, souvenirs there. And, uh, you know, a couple of the stands were owned by uh, Jews and on the Shabbat. Do you, do you think they were at the stadium selling souvenirs? Yes, they were. <laughs> okay, uh, Peggy. Oh, Susan. Her comment. What did she say? Well, what she said is Yeshua suffered 39 stripes. Oh, yeah, 39 stripes. That is, that's, that's interesting. Susan, I'm going to put you in charge of coming up with a study on that. <laughs> you and Les. <No. laughs> okay, you guys. And I was going to share in a third place, the prophet Jeremiah specifically warns the people not to carry on the Sabbath. He says, and this is from the complete Jewish Bible. It says, if you value your life, don't carry anything on Shabbat or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Don't carry anything out of your houses on Shabbat and don't do any work. Instead, make Shabbat a holy day. I ordered your ancestors to do this. Um, so uh, let's take a look at the Sabbath in Genesis chapter two. It says, on the seventh day, God was finished with his work, which he had, had made. So he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and separated it as holy, because on that day, God rested from all the work which he had create, created, so that it itself could produce. Uh, Maria, like you said, it's all about creating, you know, don't, don't create. But then I like, I want to get into now, nowadays uh, with the Christian church. Only one day out of the week, God mm -hmm. it holy and, and set apart. And that is the Sabbath. That is the only day that God specifically, and it's in his word. Okay, so here we are almost 6,000 years later, about 3,600 years after God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and over 90% of Christian churches disregard the seventh day uh, and observe Sunday as the day of rest. Why? You may be surprised to learn that if you look for it in your Bibles, in what Christians call the New Testament, you will not find Sunday mentioned even once. Somebody wants to get in, Peggy. Uh, what you will find is eight times it says the first day of the week. Okay. And six of those references describe the day after Yeshua's resurrection. Let's look at the two that are not about Yeshua's resurrection. Okay, if you want to write this down, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. We read, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Paul is asking the Corinthians to gather supplies. 
He is not asking them to worship, uh, but to do the physical work of gathering goods for those in need in Jerusalem. There is nothing mentioned here as the day of rest. Okay, in Acts 27, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Again, it's the day after the Sabbath, or it would have said that they gathered on the seventh day. Okay, let me finish this thought, you guys. <clears throat> All we have to do is study the church fathers of the early Christian church to see exactly what happened. There is no truth whatsoever to say the disciples started worshiping on the first day of the week after Yeshua's resurrection. Paul, remember Paul, what was Paul? A Pharisee of Pharisees. He never would have changed the Sabbath. Gary, you were first. Okay. I think we need to differentiate like on Sunday. You know, a lot of people worship or go to church on uh -huh. Sunday. I think we need to differentiate between worshiping on Sunday and resting on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Because although they may worship on Sunday, it's often perceived that Sunday is the day to do all the work, all the fun, all the stuff you didn't get to do during the week. So although they may worship on Sunday, they don't rest at all on Sunday, which is a, you know, you need to really make that distinction because like Sunday was, I mean, that's what I grew up in. Sunday was a day to do house projects, to work in the yard, to do all these sorts yeah. of things, yeah. to a whole concept it's not only bastardized from not observing the correct day, but it's also bastardized by not even the concept of rest. And this yeah. goes all the way back to Constantine who changed it. Yeah. And yeah. the Catholic Church is very open and honest. Hey, we changed it. Yeah. There's nothing in the Bible that says it's yeah. supposed to be changed, but we are superior to the Bible. So this is what we did. And they actually laugh at the Protestant churches who think themselves so much different from Catholicism, but in reality, they're practically just like it. No, no, very, very well said because you're 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 absolutely right. Let's let's let Sharon go first. Um just two points. Um I think we need to be careful about criticizing because we don't know how many in the Sunday churches are part of God's assembly. I think many are, all who have called upon Yeshua as their savior and Lord. And uh -huh. they haven't grabbed hold uh, that they're worshiping on the, on, on the wrong day. But also point two, we don't know that we're worshiping on the right day. The, the, the calendar got really screwed up in Babylonia and yeah. we don't know exactly which is the seventh day now, but we're, we're, we're obeying it to the best of our ability because in our culture, we know that Saturday is the Sabbath day. So, um, you know, we can't be so self-righteous, I don't think. No. We, can, we can call out the wrongs, but um, I think many on the in the Sunday church are part of his, in his tent. Um, anyway. No, thank you, Sharon, because my wife does that with me all the time. You know, <laughs> I criticize someone and she says, instead of criticizing them, just, you know, pray for them. I mean, yeah. they may come to the acknowledgement, they may not, but still, you know, are, are, are we going to be in paradise, you know, with them? Yeah. You know, Paul was first. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Yep. I agree with Sharon because one of the things that I know is most of us started out in a Christian church. When yeah. I started out in a Christian yeah. church, I had no concept of Shabbat at all. Yeah. It was church met on Sunday. I met on Sunday. I never thought of it as a day of rest. We went to church. We did all kinds of stuff. We went and ate. 
we'd go to the park afterwards, we'd drive to the beach, we did all kinds of stuff on Sunday. So it was never to me a day of rest. Right. But it was the day in which we met. Now, then, with that concept being switched over to the messianic community, how much different are we? Yeah. <laughs> we're not. We do the same thing we did on Sunday, only now we're doing it on Saturday. We do wear to leads, sometimes keep up. Sometimes we say prayers in Hebrew and we sing songs in Hebrew, and boy, we're different. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Pastor Bruce. Yeah, I, going back to what Pastor Paul said uh, a while back, truth is relative. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so the idea is what, what we say in the spirit realm or in the, in the believer's realm is we call it revelation. Until you get the revelation of something, you really aren't held liable in the truest sense yeah. because the spirit has to convict you. So for Christians that are worshiping on Sunday, they're fine. They're fine and dandy. Uh, are, they don't have the revelation of the Shabbat. Yeah. They're not, there's no condemnation right. for those that are in the Lord. You see, my wife's pointing at me. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's the same thing. Uh, we have to go from faith to faith. Even a better way to say that, I think, would be say, you, you have to go from revelation to revelation. So when God gives you a revelation, that becomes a solid truth in your life. Amen. And if you break that, then you are breaking uh, your, your, in fact, your conscience, you're, you're breaking what God has spoken directly to you, whereas so much of this other stuff is so ambiguous and we're doing the best we can, but if you re really receive revelation, which we're praying for, which we're praying for, uh, obviously Amen. everyone's Amen. praying for that, so then now you're, to whom much is given, much, much more is, is required. That's right. See, so we have to really be careful. Uh, we're not a whole lot different than Christians. Mm -hmm. However, we are a couple steps ahead of them in some areas. And in other areas, I think we're behind them. I think we've actually gone backwards in a few areas. Yeah. Mm. So this is called our walk. This is called our journey. It's all about the process. Mm. We've talked about that a hundred times. It's about the process. Right. God isn't really interested in your theology. Yeah. He's really not interested in your take on things. He's interested in conforming you into the image of Messiah. And that is a life, at least a lifelong process. I tend to think it's going to extend into, I into do too. heaven as well. I do too. I, I, I'm not convinced that the moment you go to be with the Lord, now you're just, it says you'll see him as he is. So you'll, you'll take another step and you'll have a new revelation, but I don't think you're going to be exactly like he is the day you get to heaven. Right. Okay. I've got three people that are going to talk. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie, and then Bonnie, Lucy, and then Kent. Everyone is saying you guys aren't speaking into the mics and they can't hear you. Oh, did you hear that? Speak into the mics, everybody. Okay. But before I go to anyone, let me give you a few fill-ins. <laughs> Okay, in Roman numeral number one, letter C, the building of the tabernacle is important, but the Sabbath is more important. So your feelings there is important. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to Roman numeral two. The seventh day is holy, set apart for the Lord. So the fill-in is seven. Letter A, what we've been discussing, and we're almost done with it, but we still got a few more things. Letter A, no work on the Sabbath. You know, sometimes when we talk about work, isn't it, uh, if it's something uh, that you don't like doing, hey, honey, no work on the Sabbath. <laughs> but if it's something that you enjoy doing, hey, I'm going to go outside and take care of, you know, and, and take care of this. <laughs> Very, yep, exactly. Okay, letter B, the Sabbath is for 
families to gather together. And I'm not only talking about the immediate family, it's also our church family. It's very important that we gather together. I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, Dorothy getting up and she, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to put anyone on the spot when she said, you need to be here. And she said, you so-and-so, you need to be here. So and so we missed them. And it was wonderful to see everybody, your church family there. And that's what it's all about. So I'm not only talking about immediate family, but church family gathering together. Okay, and letter C, do not forsake the fellowship of the saints. And we read that earlier. And then what, we, what it got everybody going in letter D, 39 categories of labor forbidden on the Shabbat, 39. And one of them, and number one, well, there's two of them there, don't light a fire or pick up sticks. I know it. Mine, but remember, they're not made of wood anymore. How many remember pickup sticks when they were made of wood? <laughs> oh, do you still have some? Oh my! You know what? Hold on to them. They're a collector's item. They'll be worth some money. Yeah, but yeah, I remember that Peggy and I we used to play many moons ago. Pickup sticks with wooden pickup sticks. You know. So okay, um, who? Bonnie, you were first. I remember when I first found out about Shilo and um, that's when Jade and Carolyn were still coming and I started coming when we were over at my yep. church oasis. Yep, I remember so that. What I was doing was I was coming to Shabbat on Saturday and I was going to my church on Sunday and I was enjoying both of them. But somewhere down the line, and I don't want to say I was convicted, but I guess I learned that we are supposed to be meeting on the Sabbath and not on Sunday. And I was going on Sunday because I still had a lot of friends that went to Oasis and that yeah. was the only way that I was gonna see them. Yeah. But now I feel just in my own heart, I feel this is the day that I'm supposed to go from you know sunset to sunset. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you something about Bonnie, everyone. Um, when Peggy and I went, when we were at Oasis for a little while, and Peggy and I walked in and we saw Bonnie there. We were overjoyed because we've known Bonnie for years. You know, we, we're, you know, we're family. So, uh, you know, that was just a joy to us. And then she joined our congregation, you know. Go ahead, Lucy. It becomes, You're good. You were on. It becomes interesting when revelation. Keep it right there. It becomes interesting when revelation seems to have two components to it, like knowledge and yeah. conviction. Mm -hmm. So would you say that that revelation is only the conviction? Do you separate those apart? I don't. What think about so. people that have the knowledge of the Sabbath or the knowledge of anything else? Yeah. They have the knowledge. They, they It's not like they haven't heard. Right. But but is 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 knowledge not part of conviction? I, Mark, which is revelation i think you you hit it uh lucy because i know that peggy and i sometimes we talk about this where there are some uh pastors out there that they're this close you know they know the sabbath is saturday they're still doing sunday but they're this close because they also observe um the festivals they're getting very close they just haven't gotten over the hump before i go to you pastor bruce uh kent has been waiting uh patiently yes uh i just wanted to say it might be a good idea for us between us not to say sunday monday tuesday because as pastor bruce taught us these are are actually giving giving reference to 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 false gods i don't celebrate the sun so why not just do it day one, like in Hebrew, Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni. That means first day, second day, third day, and Shabbat. Right. <laughs> just among ourselves, at least. That's you're absolutely right. But I, 
I still catch myself, Kent, saying uh, Sunday or Monday, you know, this Tuesday we have prayer night, you know, uh, instead of saying, uh, what would that be, day uh, three, you know, <laughs> we have prayer night on day three. And that I, depends I, on whether you're talking about the evening or the day. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah exactly. The elders to figure out the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's craziness. I hear what you're saying, Kent, but uh, whoa. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Let me address what Lucy was saying, because I think it's good revelation. Uh, you know, the word says, uh, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. The truth in and of itself doesn't set you free. There has to be an action with it. You can, you can know that Yeshua is the Messiah and not even be saved. You have to have that action of receiving. So knowledge becomes the doorway uh, through which conviction can flow. So you get a knowledge. It doesn't have to happen this way, but I see knowledge as a doorway to conviction. You get knowledge, and this is all part of that process. You're studying, you're studying. You're, how many times you've been studying and you read something, you go, man, I never saw that before. And, and yet you know you have because you've read that verse a hundred times. So you did see it. What you're saying is, wow, so there's something different now. So, and you know the truth all along. You can quote the scripture, but now all of a sudden the revelation is hitting you and the conviction is setting in. And that gives you the opportunity then to be set free. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Gary. This is for Pastor Bruce. I mean, it's going to be a personal question. Um, you've mentioned details before. Yahoo. <laughs> it's not that kind of thing. <laughs> the elders I, will judge. <laughs> Go on, <to> know more. <laughs> um, I know you struggled a long time while you were still doing the Sunday thing. With? With, with, with what you did, I mean, Sunday worship. When we were a Sunday church. You had a long time of studying, or blah, 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 before you finally made the decision by years to take the church that you were serving at from Sunday through Saturday. Right. What dynamic or whatever what kind of like what Lucy was talking about what you followed up on what was it inside of you that made you different unique and special from amongst many of your peers in the ministry to actually take the Sunday church you were serving at and bringing it into Saturday because that is an extremely rare occurrence because I don't, in fact, I don't even know of any other pastors that have done that. There are a few. Well, I don't know them, but the, the point is, there's not many. What was it inside of you, not only that came to that conviction, but taking the next step forward to actually putting it into motion? Go go ahead and then go ahead and then I have something to share too. Okay. Uh, the for me, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about the messianic movement is the messianic movement. By and large, most of the people in it uh, are truth seekers. I'm not saying Sunday Church are not truth seekers. I'm not saying that at all, but. We were not satisfied with what was taking place on Sunday church. We felt there was more. We knew there was more. I, we're still there. We still know there's more. I mean, we haven't, like I say all the time, we haven't arrived anywhere. We're, we're, we're getting it. So uh, I think when, as I was studying, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a reactionary in many ways. But in other ways, I'm really slow. And uh, 
when it comes to major change, I'm a slow individual. You, if you think you're going to just come tell me something and I'm going to jump on board, you're wrong. That will not happen. I need to, you may perk something in me, so I go start, I start to study it because I'm a, I'm a real student. I love to study. So I will go study it. How long is it going to take me to see the same revelation that you see? I don't know. It could be one day or it could be 50 years. Uh, but I will study it. So in this case, I was studying it out. And I and the more I studied, the more I convinced myself that this is, in fact, the truth. And because we're truth seekers, once you feel like you've discovered truth, you now have to act on it. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to say, well, this is what I believe. This is why we left Calvary Chapel. <clears throat> Because Calvary Chapel had a theology for the gifts, but no practice. And I thought, that's just dumb. You believe in them, but you're not going to do them. I believe if you believe something, you're gonna, you, you need to do it. And you're going to start with baby steps. That's fine. But you're going to be doing something. So that's, that's really why we moved into this when we discovered that, you know what, this is, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Uh, the messianic is a closer step than where we're at. I wanted that. And I'll change again uh, if if need be. I, I don't think the messianic is the cat's meow. We haven't arrived. We haven't arrived. <laughs> yeah. So I think that uh, for me, that, that becomes the issue. I, I want to hear input. I don't mind hearing input. People used to get on me about wearing the seat seat. I, you know, when are you going to put on the seat seat? When God tells me to. I don't care what you think. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not interested in human opinion. It, it doesn't really phase me. Oh, but we're not human. We're your congregation. We're your little baby. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay, uh, so hopefully that answers it. I think Kathleen had step right in. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say because it's you know I'm thinking back. Um, I I would say it was actually learning the history, the real history of the church, not what he learned in seminary, mm -hmm. but when we really studied as a congregation yeah. the real history of the church and we we the lights went on and we said oh my gosh we're not doing what jesus yeah. did we're not doing what his disciples did we're on the wrong day we're we're you know with a lot of wrong teaching and that i think was such an epiphany that we said oh okay well there's no option right we have to change right and then we, <clears throat> we looked back and realized god birthed us on Shabbat, on Friday nights in our living room, yeah. and the Holy Spirit always showed up in such a powerful way that we've always done Friday nights for 48, 47 years, except for short little breaks, but that's when the Holy Spirit really showed up. We said, oh my gosh, we didn't know it, but it was Shabbat then yeah. that where we were birthed, yeah. you know? Yeah. So go ahead, Peggy. Um, it's not me, and I don't know what teaching she's referring to. Kathy said, Are there any old CDs left from that teaching? Oh, we would have we would have to go, yeah, we would have to go into our archives and and, and pull them out. But Kathy, uh I would think yeah. <laughs> but but I I wanted to share too because Peggy and I have been part of this congregation back when we were a vineyard and then we were in basically a non-denominational church after that and we made the change and the change wasn't immediate the change was was uh it was gradual in the sense that we were fed we were given the knowledge what's that microphone oh my gosh it's on okay. All right, the don't turn your volume up. Tell yeah, turn your volume up because my uh, microphone on the screen is hitting the top. <laughs> okay, but what I was going to say is uh, when when uh, this revelation hit 
our congregation, uh, oh my gosh, it, our eyes opened up. And as Pastor Bruce was saying, you started studying the word. And Pastor Bruce would bring something and then we'd go back and look it up. We said, you know what? He's exactly right. You know, so it was, it was, it, and then when we finally made the, the, the change, it was, uh, it was just wonderful for us meeting on the right day. I think the most amazing thing for me was too, is understanding the festivals that these are God's festivals because all we were doing up to that point was man's festivals. So uh, Pastor Bruce, you're gonna jump in? Yeah, let me just, just add to that because as I mentioned, it took five years to make the transition. So I didn't get up and say, man, this is what it is. And we studied it and we talked about it and we absorbed it. Uh, and we, we didn't lose anybody initially when we made the change. So what that means is, is we waited for the slowest or the weakest link in the chain to come along mm -hmm. before we really made that final jump. Um, and so when we did, everybody was on board yes. with that. And I think that that's very important because we are a congregation that's committed to change, but we're not changing tomorrow. That's not happening. We're gonna change as that revelation comes. And we all start getting it. And, and I think that's what's so important to understand uh, about that. And I was going to say something else, but again, I forgot too. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Speaking yeah, of. I, I find it uh, strange what Pastor Bruce said, that he's not sure that the, that the Messianic has arrived. I, I just wondered what you mean by that. And so I was looking in James 127 about where uh, pure and undefiled religion is actually defined. This is, uh, you know, to uh, in the sight of our God and Father to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So there's can you conclude from what you said and from this says that you don't really have to be a church goer to make it to heaven to be a good believer a christian i per my personal belief is you don't have to do anything to go to heaven you don't have to read your bible you don't have to pray you don't have to go to fellowship you have to know the lord and receive the lord you have to be born again and that's works free there is no works involved um and I realize that's a very radical statement because I personally believe also that if you are born again, you will do those things. Right. The, the whole idea in James is he is addressing, uh, it's, it, he's addressing a couple specific issues, orphans, widows, and being undefiled. But there's a lot more in the Bible than that. Right. See what I'm saying? So I think that, um, you know, I remember what I was going to say, Pastor Paul, when we, as we did this, when we made the conversion, we started, like our first soup coats where we would go around and fellowship at a different house each yeah. night and uh, do pot, uh, potlucks and, and uh, we didn't even know the word oneg then, uh, but we do these potlucks. And so we were celebrating the, the, the soup coat in, in this progressive step. And now we would look back and go, well, that was a good first step, but that's all it was, was a first step. Right. And when Pastor Paul came on board, uh, his duties became to really build out the Moedim, yeah. which he's done. We celebrate the Moedim like nobody, no other Messianic congregation that I know of, personally. Yeah. Uh, we, we really do them to the best of our ability. Now, are we doing them all exactly right? No, it's, it's interesting. You look back over 12, 13 years yeah. that we've done it, whatever. Uh, we've, even that's been progressive in nature. We'll t discuss it and we'll go, well, maybe we should start initiating this or that. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we brought in the, the waving of the lulavs at some point. We brought in the processional at some point. And so... So as far as arriving, no, we haven't arrived. 
I suspect that should the Lord tarry in 10 years from now, our Sukkot will look different than they do today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our Shabbat services, I would expect that. Yeah. Well, you know, Pastor, it'll all be different. <laughs> you know, Pastor Bruce, Pastor Bruce had a vision for this congregation, and uh, and that's where where we're at. When Pastor Paul came on, he had a vision for our uh, festivals, and and that's where we're, we are at now. So, uh, like, it it's been a progressive. Uh, of a forward step and we're making alia and it's been it's all about the journey you know so and it's been a very good journey um lucy was first pastor paul so it seems to me that most of us live in doorways of truth yeah. deciding whether we are going to take the next step into revelation or allow god to, to take us there Amen. so good. so we could live in a doorway yeah. forever yeah you know on whatever issue whatever topic because yeah. you know knowledge is that's a good way to put it yeah the doorway i'm in you know and when we get to the last point of the night or the of the torah study you're going to see we're going to we're going to hit on that too pastor Can paul answer oh that just yeah. first real quick um years ago i was meeting with another pastor here on the mountain and uh the the lord the spirit of the lord was bringing him into the gifts so he wanted to disciple under me and how to move in the gifts of the spirit and i said sure i'll be more than happy to meet with you so i met with him a couple of times and then he came to me after a while and he said you know what we're i'm not going to bring my church into the gifts he said i believe in them but we're not going to go there because i'm going to lose too many people and that and his board was well that was another pastor his board yeah, his board apps. One pastor, his board said, "No, we're not doing the gifts here." Yeah. Oh. And so he he told me, "No, we're not going to do the gifts." <laughs> and the other pastor was just afraid of losing people and and losing his congregation and his paycheck. Yeah. And that was a huge concern for me in the messianic. I mean, I I thought, well, uh, I look back now, you know, kind of like our. Chinese proverb yesterday. I look back now, and I think I had I had already gone back into secular work when we made the transition. So I didn't I wasn't depending on a paycheck from the church. I remember that. And and what had appeared to be kind of not a blessing initially when I had to go back into secular work now became a blessing for me because I, I wasn't trapped by that paycheck thing. Right. And then and. And I don't blame these pastors. That's a huge issue. Well, the one is, was gone shortly after. The one, day. yeah, the one that just said he was afraid of losing people. He, he went away real quick. The other one is still ministering and uh, actually probably has the largest church on the mountain right now. Mm. But 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 they, they're they stuck in the doorway. Okay, Pastor Paul, and then we're going to move on, everybody. <laughs> the only thing I was going to say is you know, talk about knowledge. When we go back and we go back to the reference that, Pat, that Pastor Vince brought up uh, about Paul preaching until midnight. See, the real, real issue of that is he wasn't celebrating on the Shabbat. This was after the Havdalah service, yep. the closing of the Shabbat. And then he's teaching. Now, when you follow that through and you realize that Shabbat begins on Friday evening. For us as a Messianic congregation, quote unquote, if we decided that we wanted to follow the biblical perspective, because when Yeshua showed up at synagogue, we assume that it's on Shabbat mornings, but we assume. <laughs> it, it doesn't say he showed up on Shabbat mornings, it showed up on Shabbat. Um, could it have been in the evening on Friday? Very possible. Could it have been at the Havdalah service at the close of the show? Very possible. But we know for sure that Paul was at the end. Mm -hmm. Now, for us as a congregation, would it be possible, and I'm just saying, not that it's requiring a change at any specific moment, but <laughs> could it be possible that we would meet on a Friday evening and then take the Shabbat and come back at the end of the Shabbat for a Havdalah service mm -hmm. and then run our service as long as we wanted. Um, 
you know, I mean, those kind of things are all possibilities. Right. And is it viable? Sure it is. Um, is it correct? Possibly. Uh, is it the best idea? Maybe. I mean, I think somebody said somewhere, time will tell, you know, maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay, before I move on, uh, Jen would like to uh, ask a question. Go ahead, Jen, unmute yourself. Hi, um, my question was about what is this big fear about the spiritual gifts? Because um, I was raised actually, well, not raised, but when I was a teenager, I started attending a Presbyterian church and we actually went through um, an in-depth study on the spiritual gifts. So I was never like, quote, afraid of them or whatever. What is this big fear with them? Dr. Paul or Bruce, you want to answer that? I, I think the biggest fear for people with the gifts of the spirit is you're yielding total or the Theoretically, you're yielding total control to the spirit. So you're out of control and that freaks people out. Um, the idea of tongues, for instance, freaks people out because they don't understand. Right. They don't know what's going on. Um, it's when the spirit, John Wimber used to say, when the spirit moves, it can get very sloppy. And of course, that's by our definition of sloppy because he's not a God of chaos. But now you got to talk about whose definition are you going by. So right. the spirit uh, scares most people. They they want to have a grip on things. I think that's the best way I can deal with that. Someone had said recently, one of our, our regular person, that they were a little concerned. Maybe we shouldn't be doing tongues in our worship or message because what if new people come and it's going to scare them away? But then they said, but then they thought about it but well no we have to allow the holy spirit amen right? amen amen one more <laughs> you know all the things about the spirit they are scary because people don't like to lose control and usually it's the pastors that don't like to lose control but god has already established the method in which control is kept there's two things about tongues there should be an interpretation I mean, if you're edifying yourself and building yourself up for the movement of the spirit through you, well, then you edify by singing, saying, praying, whatever in tongues. But scripture says that when tongues are brought in the congregation, there's, there's a limitation as to how many. There's also the responsibility of having an interpreter, which means then when tongues are brought, you want people to understand what's being said. That's the whole point. Uh, the other gifts, the elders are supposed to judge. No matter what goes on, the elders are responsible to stand before the Lord and go, you know what, that is for us right now, or it's not. Right. And, and most of us, most of us don't want to be the defining moment to say that's wrong, and, or however we say it. We, we just don't want to put ourselves in that position. So most churches do not operate that way. We, we, I'm from a Pentecostal background. I mean, I, I know yeah. what goes on. And, you know, we dance in a circle here because it's unifying. Uh, in the Pentecostal realm, people just get up and start running around, dancing, twirling, climbing over chairs. I mean, they can do oh, anything. Oh, we've had that. <laughs> we've had many of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One more. One more. Go ahead, Gary. No, <laughs> let's move on. I think a lot of it comes down to that which we know and that which we are familiar will with yeah. in yeah. like in culture. For instance, a great deal of people have trouble with the concept of taking an animal to a temple, having a priest slice its neck, draining the blood, cutting it up, and they take a piece and person you brought it takes a piece and you bring it home and you cook it and eat it for some reason that seems 
like something barbaric, uh, <laughs> barbaric than a heathen, blah, 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 blah. However, on the other hand, we see no problem going to good ones and buying a roast <laughs> or a slab of meat and bringing it home and putting it on the barbecue. That is exactly right. Yeah, it's right. the same thing with tongue or any of these other types of things. We, we jump back at them because it's not known to it's unfamiliar. There's things we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And with a concept like, especially with spiritual things, because we have very you know, it's a, we see through a mirror dimly and we can't see beyond that veil. But a lot of the stuff that the Father's commanded us to do in a physical realm is because of what occurs in the spiritual realm as a result of that. But we don't know what that is in the spiritual realm. And we like power and control, so we are hesitant or resistant mm -hmm. because we don't know, like what Bruce shared yesterday, the full story, like at the beginning with the horse running off, you know, we don't know what the end of the story is, or the rest of the story is what's his face. Yeah. Paul Herbert. Paul Herbert. Yeah. So it, we we really need to take a step back. I mean, at first, getting familiar with the Moedines was confusing. Right. I don't understand it. I mean, I understand the whole thing at Christmas because I was raised with that. But the Moedines, uh, uh, it's confusing, you know. Now we've left all those Christmas Easter's behind, and now we're embracing the Moedim. And each year, we're learning more, and we're getting better. Amen. Each time, I learn more. We get better. You know, growing up Baptist, Lucy grew up Seventh Day Adventist. All her friends said, "Don't marry the guy, because <laughs> the religion you're going to end up getting divorced." Amen. She was right all along. And I had to examine that and realize I was wrong and she was right as far as the Sabbath goes. Right. right. And by the way, all the friends that told her not to marry me, they've all been since divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Lucy. Why did I know that? Lucy, you have the final word here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Real quick, this issue isn't ever talked about very much. I've never even heard it. I don't think from any church. Does any church have interpretation of tongues? Is that, I know I read it, we know it, but it's like this in our church. Does anyone ever interpret what someone just said? Like, this is what they just said. Yes, they have, but it's been very clear. Yeah. Okay. Concerning praise and worship in our heart is different from giving a word. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, tongues is the spirit uttering through you with groanings too deep for words and when that's taking place there's no need for an interpretation okay uh, it's not included in romans at all what happens is when a person stands up and speaks out loudly in tongues to the congregation there needs to be an interpretation has that happened Oh, yeah, it's happened oh, yeah. many times through the years, but, but most people don't stand up and just shoot a, a tongue out there. And when it does, we ask for the interpretation. Yeah. When uh, that person or someone else? No, someone else. usually somebody else has, you know, and usually as a pastor, the Lord will give me the interpretation uh, and I'll share that then. Uh, when we're singing, you're not singing to man. You're singing to God. I mean, and when you're praying in tongues under your breath, you're not speaking to man. You're speaking to God. That's what Paul says. So the only time you need that interpretation is when you're actually in the congregation speaking to men. And you're and now you need an interpreter. Okay. Now that's 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 my understanding. And because I'm the pastor, that's what it is. <laughs> in this congregation. I'll Which go with tell. that. I'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's many people that, uh, you know, think differently on that. And that's all right. Yeah. 
but that's how I see it. So that's how we operate. Um, so yeah, we do need an interpreter when somebody takes the floor and they speak in tongues. And the limiting, we don't do, you know, we don't really, you know, it says let two or three prophesy and let the rest judge. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't limit it to two or three. Usually we, that's about the most we ever get, but we're trying to encourage the gifts. So if somebody comes up and says, well, I got a word from the Lord. I go, no, we've had our three sit down. Uh, that person's not likely to stand up and share again. So we're trying, there's a fine balance between trying to teach people to step out and shutting them down. It's about order. It's about order. So, and, and that's the essence of that thing. It's not two or three. Right. That's legalism. It's about the order. It's about the essence. Let it flow. It's not supposed to take all the, the, the service. And, and of course, most people... My opinion, most of the words you hear from the from in the church are not even words from God. Mm -hmm. They're encouraging words. They're not harmful. We're not going to lambast somebody and correct them unless they're really off the wall. And I have corrected many people through the years. Yeah. And and so there's such a fine balance between teaching a congregation and then and directing that teaching. And and coming across with something that's so strong that it shuts it all down. Right. I know for me that I've been uh, I I I've given words in the past, but I know I'm not saying I've been shut down, but it's been a it's been a pretty long season. But what the Lord has really impressed upon me is to edify my brothers and and sisters, to give them words of encouragement. And uh, so that, you know, that is where I'm at in this season, you know, just giving words of encouragement. But here, I'm going to move on, you guys. Uh, the, um, yeah. the internet is unstable for me, and I'm not connected. It keeps trying and trying, so you're going to have to watch. That. I'll have to watch it from here? Okay. Okay, well, I, I'm not even on uh, chat. The Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, everybody. Now, what what is it in what they call the New Testament that that they are allowing themselves to to change it from the from the uh, seventh day Sabbath to a first day of the week Sabbath or first of week observance? Most of the Christian Church meets on Sunday because they say that Yeshua was resurrected. Uh, let's see if that's exactly what it says. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, and let's read in verse 1. And it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already removed from the tomb. Okay, uh, I agree. It was Sunday morning, the first day of the week, or it was day one, first day of the week. Uh, it said, but it says that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. It was still dark. So did she have a, a you know, some type of torch with her as she appeared? I would say she would have needed something, you know. Now, remember, too, uh, it's a full moon, okay? At the, at the beginning, at, at the time of his death, there was a full moon. So she may have come when it was still dark, but the moon gave light. So she may have been able to walk there like that. So it, but I'm thinking it may have been about 4 a.m. in the morning, something like that, but she sees that the stone is rolled away. I don't believe Yeshua rose the first day of the week in the morning. OK, what it would. But what I do believe is Mary Magdalene showed up and no one was there. The body was already, you know, he was already resurrected. OK, and then if you talk about the three complete 24 hour days, as it says in the word, uh, you know, that that wouldn't have worked either. So uh, as we can see, the idea of basing Sunday worship on uh on Yeshua's resurrection, 
uh, comes not from the Bible, but from a faulty human uh, tradition. Okay, uh, so uh, you know, and I and I we've talked about this Shabbat so much here, uh, two hours of it, uh, <laughs> but it, it's very important that we know uh, about the Sabbath, when the Sabbath is, just so we could speak to our friends who uh, to who observe a uh, a Sunday uh, observance. So, uh, you know, we didn't even cover the punishment for not keeping the Sabbath day holy. <laughs> uh, only one time do we ever read an Israelite being executed for working on the Sabbath. If even with this account of a man working on the Sabbath, if you remember, the people didn't know what to do with him. What did, what, what, how did they handle this? Moses, you know, go before the Lord and ask, you know, what are we supposed to do? Well, he came back and said, put this man to death. But what we do know uh, that over, over 3,000 years, <clears throat> this has been a very serious uh, commandment for the Israelites, for the Jews. The fourth commandment they take seriously. Uh, in letter E, no private believers on Shabbat. So what I'm saying is don't get off on your own if, if you don't have to. If you're sick and you're going to uh, stay away for, for, for the Shabbat, that's different. But if you're capable of coming in and, and fellowshipping with all your brothers and sisters, come on in. Okay, in Roman numeral three, it's time to build the tabernacle. We're there, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay god wants the gifts to be voluntary a long list of needed items is given to the people uh and uh you know moses uh he re he responds he goes to the people he tells them exactly what they need moses says something that that anything that they had in their possession that they willingly want to give to build the tabernacle and all the instruments in the tabernacle, okay? Not only did women bring their ju uh, jewelry, but they also weave the goat hair used to make uh, the protective coverings for the tabernacle, the, the, curtains, I, uh, the curtains. I thought it was very interesting uh, way back in 2017 that Heim Richmond shared this um, on one of his uh, podcasts, that a person in uh, in America uh, wanted to read this portion and says that if they're going to build a third temple, if they're going to get all, every construct a uh, menorah and uh, and uh, you know the table of, of altar of incense and everything, he wanted to contribute too. So what he did is he sent Heim Richmond. A very uh, a, a pretty good size piece of gold. Well, he didn't send it to him. He took it to him personally, and it was a pretty good size piece of gold, a uh, solid gold. So he took it over to to Heim Richmond, and they put it aside there to be used to make something that's going to be used in the in the tabernacle. So. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's just the idea that, you know, you're going to read something here. Are you going to take this literally? Or are you going to, you know, you're just, ah, that, that was way back when. Well, this guy felt that the Lord pressed upon him that he was to participate. And, and you know, like I said, I, I remember watching that many moons ago. But, but the high priest breath, breastplate containing the... 12 precious stones of the tribes of Israel, the musical instruments of the Levitical choir. Maybe you didn't even think about that. All this stuff was being made. Or also, you know, there's stuff that is ready, but there's still more that needed to get done. And in this chapter, that's what they're doing now. They're getting everything ready. Uh, and in letter A, Moses asked, only those with a willing heart to give to the work of the tabernacle. A willing heart. 
See, even, uh, even though many, many people were involved with the construction of the tabernacle and the priestly garments, two men, only two men are mentioned. Bezalel and Ohalaba. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. How would you? Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the name Bezalel means in the shadow protection of God. Okay, so uh, he was highly gifted as a workman, showing great skill and originality in engraving precious metals and stones in wood carving. Well, one thing I have to say, how did he, how did he learn this craft? You're absolutely right, because where did they come out of? They came out of Egypt. What were they in Egypt? They were shepherds. They took care of the flocks. You know, where would this guy have even received gold and copper and uh, precious metals? You know, so, you know, the rabbis say, say that this is one of the, the great miracles of God, you know, putting it putting this upon him because everything he knew, it was a gift from God. Go ahead, Pastor Paul. Uh, in respect to the rabbis, um, you can have how many sheep and how many shepherds does it take to watch the sheep? Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> in regards, if you have a million sheep, does it take a million shepherds? I don't think so. <laughs> so the... The men just possibly could have been involved in all kinds of trades. They could have been. Yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, we got to think because the Egyptians, what were they doing? They were the people that quote unquote took over and were running the country. At this point, by the time we get to where the Israelites are enslaved. Right. So the Israelites doing all the menial labors of any and every kind you can imagine. Uh, are they going to be doing the weaving? They're going to be doing the smithing. I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's just look at any society anywhere, and pretty much those in a, the elites are controlling the money and running the government. Right. And everybody else is out learning to do all the work. So. Yeah. Well, you know, and then uh, oh, okay, go ahead, Tila. Yeah, but in this case, with these two guys. It, it, it says both in Exodus 31 and Exodus 35 that it was God who filled them, filled them with the spirit right. of wisdom. Yeah. So they may have had talent, but God yeah. put well, it all together. Then let's do that. Let's turn to Exodus 31, 1 through 6. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called the name Bezalel, and the son of Uri, and the son of Ur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship to create artistic design for work in gold and silver and in bronze, and in cutting of stones for settings, and in carving of wood, so that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I myself have appointed with him Olaba, the son of uh, Ashamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill so that they may make everything that I have commanded you. So uh, I don't know if you're right. I don't know if they were trained in Egypt to do this type of work, but I do know that the Lord pressed it upon them and made them skillful in doing this but it also says it took those that were skillful uh -huh. so we do have to accept the fact that there were skillful workers there's lots of skillful workers uh -huh. but every skillful worker can have their skill increase well maybe and, and, paul they were <laughs> skillful in making kites and things like that and that and he, <laughs> <laughs> and he turned that around. <laughs> no, no, I understand what you're God saying. That does the same yeah. thing with us, Pastor. If you yeah. recall, uh, you weren't always a pastor. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, I know what you're saying. Go ahead, Gary. Also being a general contractor and familiar and fairly proficient in all the trades, I didn't start out that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had a, a basic 
you know, ability, shall we say, right, a talent, but that does nothing unless I practice and apply it. As years go by, I practice my trades, I get better and I get better and I get better and I get better to a level of proficiency. Right. Okay, now I'm going to design and build a house. I have the skills and abilities, yes, but all of a sudden, I come up with a design of a house that I'm going to build, which is inspired by God, let's say. Yes. Okay. Now, because of the skills and abilities I've nurtured, developed over the years, I can take this vision or whatever I now have been given from God, take those two and make what is non-tangible into a tangible reality. And I believe it was Aaron who was skilled in the arts of the temple because he was the one who made the golden calf. You know, they pressured him to utilize oh, no, wait, it. Man. He just threw those in there. And it came out. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me give you you know i gave you letter a moses asked only those with the willing heart to give to the work of the tabernacle so when you read that in number one some had a willing heart and others did not okay we we, we can't assume that everybody that was able to give gave you know there were probably some they had the opportunity to yeah, it may have been a lot, you know, they, you know, sometimes I read that everyone was part of building it. I don't think so. You know, they're, they're, you always find those that they don't want to be part of it. You know, it's just like the root revolutionary war, you know, uh, it's great. We have the Declaration of Independence and this, everybody signed it. But there were many people that opposed the war. They didn't want to uh, uh, ruffle the feathers with the mother country. You know, Saint. Now think about it. Even in Germany, you know, there were there that we there were many Americans at that time. They didn't want us to get involved. Just like today, now there are those. You know, don't get don't get involved with Russia and Ukraine. So go ahead, uh, Ray. You know, when I read that, and they said ones with the ones heart gave, the way of the, what came to me was is that when the people plundered Egypt, a lot of them were greedy and grabbed everything they could, and they realized it's too much work carrying all this stuff. Let's get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially the guy with the sore back. <laughs> okay. Uh, now let me let me go here now uh let me see uh in letter b the building of the tabernacle required each person to contribute to the work from his own skill set something that gary was hitting on about you know being taught something or or teaching yourselves so the building of the tabernacle required each person to contribute to the work from his own skill set so they uh you know, they had a skill, that's where they jumped in. Hey, I can do that. And how many times it happens here? You know, we need this or we need that. Hey, I, I can do it, you know, and we, we push them into that direction. Okay, can you think of anyone else from the tribe of Judah who obeyed God's law to build a tabernacle? David and his son Solomon, okay? In the history of Israel, it is recorded that God gave David wisdom, or at least gave him a vision of the temple, and David passed on that building plan to his son Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28, 11 to 19, if you want to read that. Uh, second, uh, for, I'm sorry, 1 Chronicles 28, 11, 19. Moreover, like Bezalel, God gave Solomon uh, wisdom in order to construct the tabernacle. And that's in 1 Kings 3.10. 
Thus, in a real way, Solomon, with his spirit uh, endowed wisdom, was just like Bezalel. Can we think of another from the tribe of Judah who will also build the temple? You got it. Yeshua, who is the son of David, a son of Judah. He will rule and reign in the third temple. Bezalel, Solomon, Yeshua. It's a glorious reminder that all scripture points us to Yeshua. Here we are in Torah, and we could see Yeshua at the end. Go ahead, uh, Maria. God is so explicit on how to do the tabernacle, and you just brought up Solomon. How come Solomon broke away and instead of just having the one menorah, yeah. he had 10. And then breaking the second commandment, build two cherubim statues and put it in the Holy of Holies. Yeah. Why he did that, I don't know. I'd like to give you an answer, but I... If he had the two statues in the Holy of Holies, yeah. And God came down and blessed the temple. How do we look on the on the second commandment of not to build, build idols? Yeah, I don't know if it was a graven image because uh, two cherubims, yeah, yeah. two cherubims yeah. were carved yeah. and put into the holy of holies. You know, so all I know is like what I've read. We're we're talking about three people from the same tribe, the tribe of Judah, and they're all involved with either the construction of uh, the items in the temple, or the temple itself, but it just, it, it's all from the tribe of Judah. Something is there. There is. And also when they brought in the ark, where did the manna and Aaron's rod go? Because there was only the Ten Commandments in the ark. Yeah, and the it manna. Was missing. Where are they? Yeah, don't know. I don't should know. ask a rabbi. Yeah. No, when, when we go, all these questions will be answered when we go to be with the Lord. But I want it you know, now. Where, yeah, yeah. You won't be here. If we had well, longer Torah study, well, maybe we're, we would find we're, out. We're already going longer. What is it, Peggy? Oh, I thought you said somebody. Okay. Now in chapter 36, it's full speed ahead in building the tabernacle. Everyone who was led to give gave. The people continued to bring offerings and the supplies of the tabernacle. And it began to add up more and more. And this is where the skilled craft, craftsmen told Moses, you know, enough, enough. We have too much. I like what Dennis Prager says about this. This is a quote from Dennis Prager. This may be the only time in recorded history a leader told the people, the government has enough money, don't give us any more. <laughs> you will. <laughs> so so uh, in letter C, the people gave too much and were asked to stop. Oh, that is, now that's a miracle. <laughs> uh, you know, in letter D, Bezalel is made the foreman over everything. With his skill set, I like, I, I like looking at this more as Moses, uh, maybe he was the superintendent, and, but the foreman of the whole project was Bezalel because he was involved in making a lot of the items for, for the temple. Uh, in in uh, number one, from the curtains, the ark, the menorah, to the incense altar, everything was made. That's what I was saying. In this portion, uh, they finally went to work. They they went to work. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead here in uh, some of the stuff that I have. But I want to talk about the mirrors of the women. 
I think it's very, it's very important because how many times in when we look at the, the temple, we're always, it's always the men, the men, the men. It's never, we never see anywhere there where, I mean, how, in your understanding, how close could the women get to the holy place? How, how close could they get? You had the, remember you had the, the women's, the, the court of the women? Yeah, that's in the temple. Yep. You know, that's what I'm saying. How, is that how close they could get? And how, how far away is the, the women's court? That wasn't in the temple. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't in the, you know, but I just wanted to show you something. Okay, go ahead, Sharon. Well, the whole thing with um, David being so precise, drawing out the blueprints of the temple and, and, you know, right now we're just building the tabernacle, but um, yeah. you had brought in how David laid out the plans, which is like the tohu of creation. I mean, it says that God made man in his own image and man is conforming to how God created the world and the universe. Um, it was the tohu first, the blueprints, and then the bohu, the physical coming together of everything. And um, I, I just think it's so interesting that um, it, it was David, he wasn't allowed to build the temple, but he could do all the plans for it. And then Solomon had to follow those plans and he brought it into fruition. Yes, amen, amen. But anyway, just... Yeah whatever there there's a gentleman uh, you know i think it's a i think it's a stretch uh sharon but 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 there's a gentleman that just walked in that totally agrees with you. <laughs> he agrees with everything i say okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what she put here in the chat room now sit down and behave <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Paul, were you going to share something? Maybe not. <laughs> no, I'll share. I'll share this. Um, this verse eight, very interesting verse, because what it does when we talk about how close could the women get? Yeah, that they could not. Yeah. <laughs> you wanted to know what God was doing? Talk to your husband at home. He'll tell you everything you needed to know. You sound like a rabbi now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty much how it was when the tabernacle was established. And this verse 8 actually is thought to be a redaction. In read, other words, read, read verse 8, 38, 8, okay, everybody. Verse eight. Okay, 37, 8. 30, Moreover, he made the laver of bronze with his base bronze from the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of beating. Okay? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, uh, first of all, mirrors were not made of glass at all. It was just polished bronze or yeah. copper, and you got to see your face. <clears throat> but they were extremely expensive and extremely rare. So the redaction concept is that when the Torah was rewritten and things were put back in to reflect the importance of women in the congregation and their relationship with God, that this was added in order to amplify and bring women up to the level of saying, okay, women and men both participated. Now, this is not mine. This is, this is just a redaction concept from those, the scholars that quote unquote go through this stuff. But if we stop and think about it, in actuality, there's a lot of things put in the scripture. Like, for example, this, is, this whole process here is different than the process that God gave earlier as to how to build and what to build. Right. God started from the inside, which he does with all of us. He starts with the heart or with the mind, with the heart, whatever you want to look at, and then builds outwardly. And that's what God did originally. He started with the, the most important aspect of the whole tabernacle concept right from the ark 
than building to the outside. Men, on the other hand, we build from the outside in. Like if we build a house, we start with the walls outside and we build everything to the inside. The last thing to go in is the important stuff, you know? <laughs> and, you know, so when we, we look at this and realize, okay, what is going on? God really wants everybody to be part. So I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad thing that this has been added, if it has been added. It, it's just part of the fact that God is saying, we need to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, just a thought, because this is the real argument that goes on in the scholarly realm. Right. Sharon, were you going to say something? I saw your hand up. Um, yes. yes. So um, I just have a question for Pastor Paul. Uh, um, so do you think that scripture, all scripture, is from God, or do you think some scripture is from man? Did you hear that? Yeah. Do you believe that all scripture is from God, or that some of it is from man? All scripture is from man. God. God breath. Yeah. Yeah. All scripture comes from God, but it's put into man. Uh, he needs to speak in the mic. Birth from God, of course. But, but once it's put into man's hand, what does how does man present it? Well, that's my question. So do you question scripture as it is in today? Today's you no, know, we, we can go on that basis, but the bottom line is that in the interim, we're making decisions as to how we interpret his word and what we do with it. Right. Right. Okay, because I believe. Sharon, that uh, the women were serving at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Okay. And I, I like what the Rashi, Rashi has taken this out of the Midrash. And he says that when Moses first saw the women bringing their copper mirrors, he thought, how can I accept these contributions uh, for God's holy tabernacle? Uh, but the Lord spoke to him and he said, accept them because these contributions are the dearest to me for all and for by means of them, the women established many legions of offspring in Egypt. I'm taking this from FFOZ. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm reading them uh, verbatim. Okay, but it says in the Midrash, God regarded the mirrors as worthy of the tabernacle because the Hebrew women under Egyptian bondage uh, had used them for the holy purpose of building the families of Israel. And I thought this was good because it says, even though the men were going out there and working as slaves, that when they would come home, the women would beautify themselves to continue to have children. And because, do you remember, where did it say in Exodus 1-2? or 112, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out, okay? So I thought that this was, and then I, I read this story and this was also out of uh, FFOZ and I thought it was really good. And it says, I once heard a story about a rabbi who was walking home with one of his students. When they came to his house, the rabbi stopped straightened his coat, groomed his hair and beard, and adjusted his hat before going through the door. The student observed this and asked, is the rabbi expecting to find someone important inside? And the rabbi explained, yes, I am. My wife is inside. <laughs> so I thought that was very good. So uh, in letter E, the women brought in their copper mirrors to contribute to the building of the tabernacle. But like I said, how close could they get? Well, we read that the women were at the doorway of the tent of meeting. They were very close, as it should be. Uh, what's that? 
I just said in the doorway. Okay. Uh, okay, before I give the last one, go ahead, Pastor Bruce. It's interesting to note that we know tradition teaches us that Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, was actually one of the women that worked uh, in the sewing of the embroidery on the curtains. And these curtains were like 60 feet high and six inches wide. They didn't just move this from the workshop back and forth every day and, and do this. And whether they actually sat up on the temple mount there and actually sewed the curtains inside the temple is, is debatable, obviously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I, yeah, Mitch. Yeah. yeah. Well, I understand that's that's the take. But when you throw this scripture in now, was it actually, in fact, in the in the tabernacle, right, or in the in the temple later? I mean, I know what the the rabbis teach that it was outside in the women, outside in the court. But when we take this, is it possible that they actually did all of that embroidery? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah. he's coming again in April, by the way. Oh, good. Did you guys hear that? Rico Cortez is coming again in April. And we are going to have a visit from uh, uh, David Rubin. David Rubin. David Rubin is coming on the 1st of April. And the 1st of April. David Rubin. And Rico okay. is coming at the end of April. And Rico at the end of April, everyone. Okay, and uh, number one. Okay, go ahead, Maria. Maria said, hold your horses. Whoa, Nelly. I'm not, I'm not throwing that forth as, as a challenge. Yeah. You no. threw the glove down and I'm picking it up. <laughs> <laughs> no. Remember it, it, 10 it, years ago when you said. No. <laughs> no, it's about the women and the weaving that the special gift that God gave to them. It was described in, in scripture that the weaving was a living weave. And the Temple Institute in Israel, they're trying to replicate that. Oh. It seems that the weave that the women did for the curtain was a 3D, that you could look at it in one direction and it would show you a picture. But if you look at it in another position, it would be different. Right. The weave was alive. Oh, amen. Amen. Yeah. So who and who can do that? Our Lord. The women. Yeah. The women. <laughs> <laughs> Through the women. <laughs> Through the women. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and number one, uh, the Midrash, uh, speaking of the copper mirror, says God's, it's God's dearest contribution. Of all that is given, the Midrash says it was the copper mirrors that was God's dearest contribution. And that is our Torah study for today. Amen.